Mythology is a strange thing. Every culture on the planet has it. Stories that are passed down from generation to generation. Stories about gods and monsters. About heroes and villains. About all things strange that lie somewhere between the heavens and the earth. For most, myths are not real. They are bedtime stories, fables, and tall tales. For some, though, a myth sometimes becomes something more tangible, something that is real and yet defies explanation. Sometimes myth becomes encounter. It was 33,000 years ago that mankind first set foot on North America. With the territory of the United States alone, there would come to be more than 500 different tribes descended from those original inhabitants. The first tribe to make contact with English settlers was the Wampanoag, who met the Pilgrims shortly after they arrived in what is now Massachusetts. The Wampanoag tribal system consisted of roughly six to eight groups, including the Natick, the Nantucket, and the Massachusetts tribes. Although these groups often had different political systems from each other, they generally shared the same culture. A culture that has survived through the centuries, despite the overwhelming odds. The Wampanoag tribes are known for their beadwork and their distinctive color palette often colored beads, face paint, and other forms of visual art consisted of contrasting colors such as purple and white or red and blue. Another surviving aspect of Wampanoag culture is their cultural belief structure, their legends. One such legend is that of the Pukwudgie. Described as short, human-like creatures with long ears and large noses, the Pukwudgie gets its name from a Midwest native phrase meaning little wild man of the woods who can vanish. The name indicates not only the diminutive size of these beings, but also their abilities. Wampanoag and Delaware tribal stories recount how Pukwudgies have the ability to become balls of fire as well as craft poison arrows and to influence the minds of others. One European description of the Pukwudgie legend appears in the writing of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Written in 1855, Longfellow's epic, The Song of Hiawatha, is based on many native tales, including that of the Pukwudgie. Far and wide across the nations spread the name and fame of Quasand, no man dared to strive with Quasand. No man could compete with Quasand. But the mischievous Pukwudgies, they the envious little people, they the fairies and the pygmies, plotted and conspired against him. The Pukwudgie, although considered one of the many native myths by English settlers and their descendants, is very real for the Wampanoag people. And recently, it has become real for non-natives too. The community of Freetown in southwestern Massachusetts has become known for reports of strange, small, human-like creatures reported from the Freetown State Forest, as well as the nearby Hockamock Swamp. The area has been coined the Bridgewater Triangle, this area is abundant with sightings of ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, and other oddities. It is within the Bridgewater Triangle that modern day sightings of Pukwudgies are also reported. Paulino is an author on high strangeness who has delved into the Pukwudgie stories often during his career. No, I've, uh, I started out when I was studying for the priesthood about a hundred years ago. 
uh, and I was very interested in the, the idea that maybe ghosts were souls in purgatory. You know, the Catholic idea that if you're not quite bad enough to go to hell, not quite good enough to go to heaven, you go to this purgatory, whatever that is. And uh, my first case was started in 1970, and I'd seen an article in the Hartford Current, I was from Connecticut, and there's this old guy had been running around this abandoned village in, in Connecticut for you know, 30, 40 years, and he had his old Kodak camera, and he would get weird photos of streaks and blobs and things like this moving through the trees. So I said, we'll test that out. So I went in, and that was just not, um, it, the, these people who were there, uh, whom you couldn't see, you, you would hear them talking, you would hear dogs barking, cows, farm implements banging together, metal, and it was like a normal day for somebody else. These people didn't seem dead at all, never mind uh, in purgatory. Or anything. So, so that really shattered my belief system on that. So as the years went by, I got more into quantum mechanics. And then we started investigating um, outside of homes that were supposedly haunted. And you'd find other things. If you could talk to the neighbors, you'd very often see run into UFO reports, things of that kind. So it began to escalate. Hot wedges are, uh, are rather rare in our experience in flap areas, but we looked up the word and uh, the Algonquian language group has a word Pukwajij, which just means little people. And this is apparently what they are. Uh, there are lots of reports from the natives uh, who don't like to come here, and, and the, the, part of this is their tribal land. Uh, they have a meeting area not far from here, and they'll come once a year, and then they scatter. They just don't like to be here. Right? So the Pukwudgies are part of their tradition as well. Little people, that's essentially what, what it means. Um, whether they use the multiverse principles that we talk about to come and go from various uh, places or times, uh, that may be the case as with other things. Um, our own experience here, uh, 2010, we felt as though we were being watched. Beautiful day like this, and right, the water's right there, and we um, just shot photos randomly, and we came up with these two photos that, that, that have, the first thing that grabbed my uh, eye was the flesh tones, all right? Now, I was a military intelligence photographer in the, in the U.S. Coast Guard in the wake of the uh, Grenada invasion. It was, uh, Coast Guard was involved, with, believe it or not. But uh, the flesh tones stood out because you don't have flesh tones in this uh, latitude unless it's some kind of fungus. That's not what it was. Uh, there seemed to be a full figure dressed in furs and there seemed to be another almost monkish face with well, almost like a cowl. And we're not saying it's, I'm just saying it's weird. It really shouldn't be there. It's an anomaly for sure. You know, whether it's Pukwudgies, I don't know. However, in 2015, I interviewed a man who was about 20 feet up the road from where we were. He saw a little figure in grayish clothes, about two and a half feet high, standing by the uh, edge of the woods, inviting him to come in. And this is what Pukwudgies traditionally or supposedly do. They invite you to come in. And because it ties in too with the uh, old world ideas of fairies, where your fairy rings and you, know, you disappear and you'll never be seen here or something like that. Or they do you some sort of mischief, right? So uh, naturally he didn't go. And the dog saw this too. He figured he'd gone bye-bye, but the dog also saw this. So he never, needless to say, he never came back there to walk the dog again. So there are stories like that um, all over this area, uh, from native times all the way up to today. The most recent one I heard was from last year. And uh, there was a man, uh, not to, uh, again, along Coppicut Road, and he saw this in his backyard. And there aren't a lot of houses along that, that uh, stretch, but it's a long road. And uh, it was just looking at him. And he really, really felt threatened. And he ran back into the house and then never saw again. that. Now, you wish people would, everybody's got cell phones with cameras. You, you wish that they would take more pictures. But, you know, when you're freaking out, it's not the first thing you think of. So that, that's the most recent one I heard. It is not only within the triangle that strange phenomena occur. Even in nearby areas, such as the Connecticut River, there are stories of Pukwudgie-like creatures. One such story was relayed by Betty Hill in the book Weird New England by Joseph Citro. Betty Hill was no stranger to unexplained activity, having been one of the first people to claim being abducted by a UFO. 
In the book, Betty claimed there was a population of small, man-like creatures living on the Connecticut River near Springfield, Massachusetts. My informant said that at one spot in the middle of the Connecticut River, there was a good-sized island that was uninhabited. Then one day it was inhabited by small, prehistoric-appearing people. They don't know how many of them there were, you know, maybe 50. They lived on the island for three years. No one ever succeeded in getting near them. The police had gone out to the island on boats and had gone on to the island, but these small, primitive people, they could outrun anyone. They'd take off running and then couldn't be found. It's not known how they lived or what they even did for food. No fires were ever seen on the island, but they lived there year-round for approximately three years. Then, just as suddenly as they appeared, they disappeared. Planes and helicopters had flown over the area, hoping to get pictures, but these little people, now they're not really tiny people, but maybe four feet tall or so, would take off running at such speeds that no one could even get pictures of them. These prehistoric looking people would be there one instant and then would start running and in the next instant, they'd just disappear. Crash Course Cryptozoology launches an investigation into the Freetown State Forest to search for any sign of a small primate or man-like creature. So what we have here is, is a, uh, it's a Chromebook application that allows you to actually read sound in real time. It doesn't record, unfortunately, but we have a camera for that. And it shows you what, uh, what hurts, so what frequency a sound is happening at, whether you can hear it or not. So we have a baseline reading of like 20, 22 to 50 or 60 hertz right over in this area of the Freetown State Forest. And our hope, because of this allegedly paranormal connection to Pukwudgies, is to have kind of a, uh, an EVP session here. And maybe something uh, interesting will happen. We've had a few sound anomalies already. So hopefully we can kind of, uh, if one such thing can be coaxed into happening, we can, we can make that happen. So we'll get our baseline reading going for just a second here. Is there anything here that's not exactly physical that would like to make contact with us? If there is, you can, you can use this device and make a sound, and even if we can't hear it, we'll see that it's happened because we have these sound waves here that we can see whenever a sound happens. So if you'd like to make such a sound, let us know. That's odd. There's me talking and there's me talking, but that was a space in between. Well, if that was you, thank you. Do you think you could do it again? If there's anything in this woods that wants to say hello or give any sign that you're here, please do so after I stop speaking. I will give you silence. Thank you. Could you make a different noise? Now, what we just located here is a very interesting find, and you can see it, you know, just along the ridges of this rock, what exactly it seems we may be looking at, which is, if we focus in properly, these wavy ridges, especially along this point here, coupled with these marks, these white marks that we have, indicate that this is actually a stone that's been struck with another stone which is uh, called flint napping and flint napping essentially is the method by which uh, tool building humans you know millions of years ago upwards of only about a thousand or so years ago when uh, stone tools were still being utilized and some you know tribes still utilize them it's the making of, of primitive stone tools and of course, us being where we are, perhaps this is actually a, uh, a Wampanoag artifact. But it looks very, uh, it's not a very old rock. It's frail too, so you'd think it would have broken over the course of a, of a millennium like that. So potentially what we're actually looking at is, you know, something more recent. And if that's the case, there might be some who would argue that, well, you know, Pukwudgies have been uh, alleged to utilize stone tools and, uh, you know, perhaps we are seeing a native artifact here, but if it is more recent, 
perhaps this is evidence at the very least of somebody recent in this area, somebody or something recent in this area, uh, utilizing stone tools and using methods like flint napping. Interesting enough, nearby we have this stone that has all of these scrapings on it. And this is almost certainly what something was using. Someone or something was using to carve that rock. So that's certainly interesting. Well, we've spent about two hours now, accumulatively, maybe about two and a half hours, hiking in the Freetown Forest today. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to find one ways around a, uh, a campground without a, without a paper map, which we've been using still, but, you know, it's, it's, it's um, the, the layout changes, gates close, and things like that. But what we found today for sure is that there is a strange feeling to the place. When you get beyond certain points, it does feel rather uneasy. And, you know, the interesting thing about all of that is the sound anomalies that we've been experiencing using our, our spectrogram software. We don't really know what's causing that because as far as, as we can tell, we haven't reviewed the footage as of recording this, the number reader doesn't spike in hertz when that occurs. But what does happen is the frequency spike occurs in the actual sound waves. So we don't know what to think of that just yet. But, you know, we have looked in the area. We have found no uh, physical signs of anything past deer or, or bears or occasionally horses because people do go horse riding back through these, these camping trails. But we do have those sound anomalies and we do have that, uh, that stone that we found, that appear apparently flint-napped stone. So that's rather interesting. That is really rather interesting. And uh, again, that could be a Wampanoag artifact, but it looks more recent. So who knows who or potentially what left that here. Our, uh, our last bit of uh, cryptozoological duty per se here is going to be to do a second or third rather EVP session. And uh, you know, we've looked for signs and haven't found much, but to do one last little survey of this particular spot we have right here, which is uh, about Mm, maybe about 45 minutes to an hour down the trail and uh, kind of just figure out if we can if there's truly anomalies happening while we're here or if we're seeing natural phenomenon because that's the point, right? Is that maybe what we're seeing isn't uh, Pukwudgie data but why people think there are Pukwudgie's data. There's something running off in that direction. It sounds big. Something rather large just moved through over there. Not like a bear, but it really did sound larger than a squirrel or a, uh, or a chipmunk or a woodchuck or anything like that. I'm not sure what that was. It was right over in that area. Heard something kind of big sound and come through the area right back here. It really did sound like the size of a dog, something like that. But we've had no luck on the uh, on this particular EVP session. And aside from that stone, we found no signs of anything that was not normal life. And, of course, rustling in the woods, although maybe a bit eerie, doesn't really mean much. I mean, I'm scanning here, and I'm just, uh, you know, not really seeing anything. There's no real physical signs of anything strange. Of course, there's strange activity, like the, uh, the carved tree with the pentacle on it and such. But there's nothing to suggest the presence of a, uh... Maybe you'd call it a, a lower primate or a, or a small ape or even diminutive human of any kind. And, uh, I mean, yeah, nothing, nothing along those lines whatsoever, really. So no tracks, no obstructions of any kind, no carvings. Only the, uh, the one kind of off artifact that we found and could have easily been man-made, that one. And there'd be plenty of reason for people to make them, so 
you know, could be something, could not be. But um, unfortunately, our time here isn't really turning up much evidence. But, you know, the eyewitness accounts that, that Paul Eno talks about, in, not only in the Freetown State Forest, but in nearby areas, those are still very interesting. And it, they're very hard to write off. And, you know, this is the nature of anomalies. Studying anomalies, as one does in the paranormal or in cryptozoology, is an anomaly is just that. It's an anomaly. And the definition of anomaly is that it doesn't happen often. So to go out there for a day and to expect something to happen is pretty foolhardy, unfortunately. Some believe the Pukwudgie to be more of a spiritual entity. Many reports fall into the paranormal category and defy scientific explanation. By all accounts, the small town of Wilton, New Hampshire is a quiet place. It's a tightly knit community with strong bonds and a peaceful atmosphere. Nestled on a hill in the northwest, Vale End Cemetery has stood for over 200 years, with its oldest grave dating back to 1752. The most famous resident buried here is Mary Ritter Spaulding, or as the locals call her, the Blue Lady. Sightings of the Blue Lady and other paranormal events are part of the culture here. Some have claimed to have even captured evidence of these hauntings. One strange story comes from a paranormal investigator named Fiona Broom. In 2000, Broom and some of her fellow researchers investigated Vail End, resulting in what Broom claimed was an encounter with a Pukwudgie. We were about to call it a night as darkness fell when I decided to stroll over to the Blue Lady's headstone for some last minute photos, just in case. I was feet away from the attorney's stone that Noreen had mentioned when I spotted what I've since called a little three feet from me. Today, I might call him a little Elmo guy. He was short, between two and three feet tall. He looked like he was covered with fur and disproportionately skinny like Rover. I paused, startled, but decided to keep walking. After all, if the Grover guy, who was a vivid shade of red, hadn't bothered me yet, he probably wouldn't. And the figure seemed more amusing. One of Broom's associates, who wishes to remain anonymous, was there the night of the sighting. So when we heard what happened to a specific um, group of people that went, well, actually uh, two people, and they had such a disturbing time, we wanted to go and investigate. Actually, the person who was handling the investigation, um, I met that night through another fellow friend who was good friends with that person and said, hey, do you mind if my friend comes along? She also... Um, is very sensitive and really goes on a lot of these ghost uh, paranormal hunts and you know the whole thing so she said yes of course so we went there was um i don't remember how many of us but there was a good handful of us that went and right off the bat when we went we could feel, some, feel something was different now not towards um you know, where where um, Mary Spaulding was, more to the vicinity, to the left of it. Felt like something was sitting on my chest. Uh, right off the bat, we knew something was wrong. And it was scary. It was very scary. The meters were going off. The more we got closer, it just glowed red. It looked like there was, it's hard to describe, it was almost like these little red beams of light were attacking us. And when it was happening, uh, we were frantic. We, we just got the heck out of there. And, and it was scary. I mean, she, the woman who did it was a major professional. I mean, she goes around the world. It was, you know, she, she knows her, her stuff. And for her to, like, that's it, let's go. And then when further on we talked about it and, you know, the word of, you know, demon and, um, as you said, the Pudgewedgies, and it was like, oh, my goodness, do you really think that could be? If something out there 
is not happy or there and energy attacks energy, you know, somebody's going to lose. And I think that's what happened. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. If you're, if you're not going with a professional, don't do it. Don't take those consequences. Non-believers that want to go and check it out, fine, dandy, but go with somebody that knows what they're doing and make sure that you get the okay, the proper permits and all that. Crash Course Cryptozoology will conduct a follow-up investigation at Vale End in an attempt to examine the claim that Pukwudgies, if real, are a supernatural phenomenon. Sighting. Oh, there he goes, he went behind the tree. There he goes. You and Griffin could just shoot B-roll, like, you know, here and there whenever you feel like it's necessary. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if the Esquire grave is the most recent one, because that's 1996. Yeah, man. It's a little bit weirder being here at night. What are those lights over there? Is that just like reflections? Or... You see my, that, right? My lights are off. My lights are off, too. And her car lights aren't on, so there's something... I guess it's like they're the reflective of some kind. What would they be reflecting? Mm -hmm. Only one way to find out, right? Myth. Yeah. Oh, is that Smith or Meth? That's Smith. Okay. What's in 19... 1909 to 1995. 55, 55 or 95? I can't tell. It looks like a 95. But I can't tell if that's from a moss. Or... <laughs> yeah, it's a 1995. You're right. Hmm. Very different right? from that angle. Look. Yeah, so. Oh, oh. Yeah, so this is more recent too, 1998. There we go. Oh, you hear that? Yeah, it was a bang. Filming with a thermal camera, the team finds only the light from a house down the hillside. The rest of the night seems uneventful. As the evidence was later examined though, it was discovered that something strange had indeed taken place. Well, while we were capturing that thermal footage, which, you know, of course, funny enough, turned out to not be a, uh, a small humanoid figure. What we did find was that while our teammate Zach was over there, he ended up recording a strange sound that none of us, including Zach, heard with the naked ear. So, you know, it, it sounds strange, it sounds like a human voice, and it couldn't be heard without the use of a camera, which is exactly what you would call an EVP, an electronic voice phenomenon, which many paranormal researchers do think is attributable to uh, a paranormal uh, a presence of some kind. 
Uh, while we were at Vale End, there was a point where we had just gotten back to the cemetery from going around downtown Wilton. We came back, and we were leaving the car, and one of us stayed behind um, to just kind of relax for a few, because we had been um, up in Wilton since like 10 a.m. We've been out since 9, getting there. And two of us, Zach and I, were leaving, um, heading away from the car. Uh, Carrick and Alex were way far ahead. And we both heard right in my um, my right ear, his left, we heard a low, deep grunting sound. We don't know what it was, but we turned around and looked towards the car. And uh, the guy who was staying in the car was already there. He was already inside. The, it wasn't the door, because I know what the door sounds like. It was just so weird. I went back and asked, uh, opened the door and asked him, like, hey, was that you who grunted? He's like, no. So we have no idea what it was, but it was very clear in um, in our ears. A little bit later, I'm kind of walking by myself near one of the tombstones, um, one of the gravestones, I should say, and it sounded like something was shuffling right beside me in the snow. Um... It was, I looked and there was nothing there. So I don't know what it could have been, but there was something with me right then. So I thought it was really interesting and kind of more unusual. Um, the story turned out to be very true within the terms of like location wise, um, where the grave was. And I had a fun time. It was really foggy and spooky. <laughs> While many accounts describe balls of light and the ability to vanish, much like the Wampanoag stories, many witnesses also assert that the Pukwudgie is a very real kind of animal. Ralph Hutchinson is the author of Pukwudgie, Legend of Sunset Hill. The book chronicles what Hutchinson claims are real experiences he has had with Pukwudgies, as well as similar creatures in Canterbury, New Hampshire. Pukwudgie, he was standing right over here. But about where this tar is, when I get to that point, because I was kind of walking slow, that's when I made recognition of his outline, and I saw the, 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 uh... Right, so a hat had gone, had gone missing, right? Right, the hat had gone missing. Right. And I saw the shape of this hat on top of this, this figure. Right. In the fog, so, I mean, because you don't see much in the fog, it's like, what the heck is that? And can you show me where he was standing again? He was standing here like this, so it was raining. So now I get right about over to there, and he uh, he was playing with the hat. So the hat was all wet. You know, right. The water's coming off. He's all wet. And he had big fat lips because he was a big fat. He was like a fat one. Right. And it was the first time I actually saw a fat one. Mm. And I haven't really seen a fat one like him since. Mm. And he was, a, you know, he was a stocky boy. He probably stood about this high. Oh, so he's a big one, too. He's, he's very a, tall. Oh, yeah. He's about this tall. All yeah, right. They right. are about this tall as adults. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's roughly my height, maybe an inch or two exactly. shorter. Exactly. The thing of it was, he he was he, he came over here. He was in the road, and, wh and when I saw him, he had the thing on. He was just standing like this. Right. But it was raining, and then I watched him do this with his three-fingered hand. Took the hat off, and he was admiring the hat. And he banged the water off it. Mm. Pulled it right on his head, and he was like, he smiled. He was hmm. smiling. He was proud of himself that he <laughs> had that hat on his head. His head was kind of big, right? So he had to like, you know, get really it down all that there. hair, his ears, and everything. And hmm. he got it on. Then, he, then he noticed me watching him, and he turned and abruptly, right up, oh, right gone. Up. gone. Wow. So he went right up that. And were there ever any tracks up this particular way that you I'm see? sure that you, he left something. He left his life. Remember, this mocking. happened many, many years ago. Right, I was 16 right. years old. I'm 63 now in a couple weeks. Right. They, they teach the young. Right. You know, right. like I said, the, the young red-haired females, they seem to, to guide them right over to the stone wall. Mm -hmm. They have them marching back and forth. So you'll go down there, you'll see something that looks like a fox. But it's not. There'll be something not quite right about it. Right. And then Mr. Fox comes over next to it, and then boom! What you thought was a fox is, is got that fox. It suddenly puts the spring on the fox. They right. put. They, they. Yes, that's their whole tactic. They. Mm. They get that creature next to them that they want to eat. Right. And and with the deer, they do the nodding. Like I said, they put those three-fingered hands above their head, 
they'll stand next to the tree and they literally nod. Like imitate this. the antlers. Right. They imitate the antlers. So the big buck or the young bucks, mostly, the ones they want to eat, see that. Mm. They, they, they only get a little presentation of it. Enough to they, they know something's there. Looks like a deer. I see some antlers. He's in my area. I'm going to run down there and beat that guy up. Boom. He runs down there next to the tree. It's over. And do they use, do they use tools? To yes. Their prey? What kind of tools do they use? They, uh, they make darts. They make darts. We might even get shot at them. They definitely throw rocks. Throw rocks, okay. Uh, they will steal human tools. Mm. You know? I, I had wedges down in here. My, my brother wanted to borrow them. I said, well... Make sure you bring the wedges out of the woods. Right. I mean, I, these are nice wedges I had, and I said, don't leave them on the stump. Mm. He's like, duh, 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 duh. and I left them on the stump. Went back to the stump. All three of the wedges were gone mm. out in the middle of the woods. Now, who's going to do that? Right. We ran into people who would pull up to the to the farm, because there used to be a big barn up there. I used to work in it as a boy, not far from here. And a couple of times, people would come up to the, to the uh, barn and say, ho! Oh, Man, I just had a close call down there. And I'd say, well, what happened? And they said, well, it's like the dog ran out in front of me, and I, I thought I hit it, and then I stopped, and I got out, I couldn't find the dog. And, mm. and then one time I, I came up into here, and there was a guy that was, his car was in into those trees over there, off the road. Mm. And I asked him what happened. He goes, he goes, some damn thing just ran out in front of me, and I, I went off the road trying to miss it. Mm. So there's been activity right here, right. a lot. Well, my cousin's house is, is this house that was right up here. And when they were children, I was up at the, the apple barn working. They had heard this creature moaning and growling and snarling and having problems. So they, they, they walked to about right in here where we are, and the creature was up in here. We, we'll take a walk up there, and I'll show you right where she was. Sure thing. And uh, so this is about as far as they dared go go and they couldn't really see the creature it, that, that's what kind of surprised me that it did sound like a woman speaking right. she, she was like no right no huh. and she repeated this so i mean that again is, is high intelligence that's right. communicative intelligence she was telling me don't come near me right right but i did i did kind of disobeyed the thing and what did she let me on? examine her further she was a red-haired one. She had dark eyes. She had a dark uh, nose. She had all, again, they have like a fat black lip. Right. Although Hutchinson's reports are highly unusual, Sunset Hill is surrounded by areas with similar sightings. The team continues its search at Sunset Hill. There are small ones here. This kind of stuff is usually done by like small rodents. There's definitely some squirrel and chipmunk marks like these right here. Um, but this other stuff I haven't seen before. Yeah, this, this is not. It's squirrels. it's like it's very small. And this is the tree where Adam said he saw something standing behind it that went up to about where's my mark? Yay high, right here. Like right about so here. So we're talking like you know two feet tall, something like that. But crouching maybe. Possibly crouch. It looked bigger. So it looked like he was like hunkered down, sort of Pretty thing. Pretty much, yeah. Well, if it's two feet tall, let's see how tall I am when I hunker down. I'm gonna be taller than two feet. So maybe that thing is like, what, four feet tall? Something like that? I'm pretty sure it was area three that we were walking around and we found a, a broken down that looks man-made out of um, an old, like, small, young tree. In the woods, I was the audio dude. Um, I held up a, a device and had headphones on to see if there was any uh, noises going on in any directions. Um, I think it was area two that we were in. Um, I was about, I'd say, up on a hill, and I was pointing my uh, audio uh, device into the direction of the noise, and I heard knocking noises. And it only happened for a brief second, so I wanted it was, it was unusual. Earlier on in Area 1, when we were walking through the woods, I also saw uh, a black shadowy figure happen between the tr uh, happened across between two trees. 
very briefly. Um, it was pro it was very small. Um, so the trees are about this big at the at the distance that I was looking at, um, and in the middle right here, the shadow had to cross that um, little hole area, and it never showed up again. So um, I've it freaked me out. 5.30 p.m., right? And it was scary, because one, it was dark, and everything looks different when it's dark out, so we had a bit of trouble finding the print. And all of a sudden, we get to the top of the hill, and me and Adam, and Adam and I, felt this gut reaction that we were not welcome, and that could have been similar to um, how we found the bear den previously, so it could have been a bear, it could have been a small rodent, but either way, we just did not feel safe. It, it, was, it was weird. And then, previously in the night, about two or three hours prior, when it was still light out, we felt a similar presence, but it wasn't as necessarily as strong, and our colleague Carrick did not feel it at that time. But once it got dark out, he confirmed that he too felt the same way. While on the investigation, the team uncovers a strange finding, an imprint, shaped like the paw of an animal. But what kind of animal? Yeah, so the Sunset Hill hair is, it's really interesting because for one thing, the location that we found it in is, is very kind of strange. You know, we're, we're up at this area with weird sightings and we find this imprint in the ground that essentially probably means nothing. If anything, it's probably a bear track. Um, you know, just by looking at it, it has that kind of wide look to it. It does somewhat resemble, you know, a shape kind of like this. So, you know, we, uh, we, we cast it and all that, and we find this hair in it later. We had no idea this hair was even in it when we cast it. And the first thought, of course, is this is one of our hairs because we were around this track. I mean, look at me. I was the person casting it. My hair probably fell in. But observing and, and microscopically studying this hair, it's not any of the team members' hair. It doesn't match the color or the length of any of us. So even though our microscopic study essentially confirms this as human hair, we don't know whose hair it is or when they were up there, etc., etc. The other weird thing is that looking at it under the microscope, it shows qualities of what's called a telogen root. So a telogen root is when the root of a hair is damaged in a certain way because the hair fell out due to stress. So the signs of a telogen root are usually uh, the shape of the root is, is very specific and there are dark spots present at the root as well. Uh, occasionally, if you have a powerful enough microscope, you can also see the actual hair tissue around the root having been damaged. Our microscope isn't that powerful, but we're able to determine that the shape and the dark spots for telogen roots are in fact present on this root. Now, you know, of course, what's interesting about that is Ralph Hutchinson, for all the very unusual, even regarding Pukwudgies, unusual stories that he tells, one of his stories is that of seeing a dark-haired Pukwudgie that seemed to be losing its hair due to mange or some other stress-related factor. And, you know, on, on that note, Hutchinson's stories are really unusual. Uh, they're really hard to swallow, but he's not the only person near Sunset Hill to report very strange occurrences. There are areas of Canterbury, New Hampshire that are very notoriously haunted or are kind of like tourist attractions because of that. So he's not the only person talking about weird things up here. And the weird thing he was talking about here did kind of coincide a little bit with what we actually find in the hair that we found in this, in this print. So, you know, we don't know whose hair it is. It's definitely human hair. And, you know, that could easily suggest, okay, well, you know, it's not any kind of new animal. It's just a person who was up there. There are some people who would counter that argument with saying, well, the proto-pygmy hypothesis states that these things, you know, Pukwudgies and other little people's stories, are real creatures that are the same thing as our diminutive human ancestors in the fossil record. So things like Homo floresiensis and Manatagalaman or Homo luzon. And in that case, if you were to find hair from one of them, it would look exactly like human hair because by all technicalities, it is human hair. Hutchinson is not the only eyewitness who believes puckwedgies are wildlife. In fact, sightings in Texas, Arizona, and many other states describe puckwedgies as a hunter-gatherer relative of man. For anyone who hasn't been to Texas, um, 
the, the it's like it's like a whole pretty, pretty much like a whole continent almost is the best way to explain it like in the east you have these thick forests that look like you know new hampshire and maine um and in the in the west you have these deserts like arizona and in the middle where where i'm at it's kind of like a mixture there's not luxurious forests but it's not a complete desert either it's kind of in the middle some parts are a little more barren than others but other parts have some decent trees it's kind of like a nice uh um balance of, of both of both worlds 20 let me think 2018 so like late 2018 i want to say late, late 2018 early early 2019 is when i started experiencing things but from my understanding um this has been going on for years and years and years in this town years and years so, so in my town, um, think of it like a, like a like a north end and a south end almost. It, it's really small, but obviously it's like the country, so it's not just the town. You know, it's like the outskirts and you know like back roads and stuff. Uh, I live more on like the southern end of it, and my ex, uh, she lived more on the northern end. Really, and, uh, you know, a few back roads up there. Really, you know, uh, reclusive if you didn't know where you were going. And there's a, there's a whole little, um, not necessarily like a neighborhood, um, but, you know, like the closest thing to a neighborhood in your, in, your um, in the country. You know, like every, you know, few acres you got your neighbor. Their rule in that neighborhood is past 9 o'clock, nobody, uh, and like obviously like they're not going to enforce it, but if you're smart, you get in by 9 o'clock or else, you know, you're more than likely going to regret it. The thing is, is, is at the same time, everyone's kind of hush-hush about it. Like, there's a an old man, you know, he's like 80, 85, and you can ask him, like, well, why don't you need to be in by 9 o'clock? And he'll tell you, like, well, you know, well, all you need to know is that you're going to, you know, you're going to regret it if you stay up past 9 o'clock, and then he won't tell you anything past that. And and it's kind of creepy out there, honestly. Um, Like, before I had anything personal happen, or before I even kind of knew, like, what was happening, the vibe out there was, was, was just, it was different. You could just make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So from my house to her house was about, I want to say about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, I was driving her down the back roads. And the back roads were the quick, quickly, you could go down the highway, but it was just quicker to go down the back roads. And it, it cut off like 15 minutes. So I went down that road. Um, and down that road, there's a little intersection. There's a little four-way intersection. And if you take left, then that goes down to her back road, and if you keep going straight, then it takes you to, you know, the main street in town. So as I'm, you know, pulling up to that intersection, she goes, did you see that? And I'm like, oh, uh, you know, and I stopped the truck. I'm like, see what, see what? And she's like, I don't know. I, like, I thought I saw something standing in the grass. So, you, you know, then I'm like, ah, you know, I, I got I to keep going. We already passed it. You know, like, I can't, you know, pop a U in the middle of the intersection. So I, I take her home. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, same feeling, you know, like, God damn, I feel like I'm being watched, you know, and then I get out of there, and I go down the same back road, and, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, I'm like, I wonder what she saw, and Lord and behold, you know, you can kind of, so by there, the grass was super thick, it was probably, um, I'm like a little, I'm like 5'11", 6 foot, uh, so it was probably at least waist high to me, you know, probably like two and a half, three feet tall. And I can see the grass, you know, kind of like moving, almost like, you know, like somebody's like moving through the grass, you know, it's messing with the grass. And I think about it, and I'm kind of like, huh, you know, so, you know, I pull around the truck, and, oh, you know, I guess curiosity, you know, killed the cat here. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, you know, I pull around the truck, and all of a sudden, I see something stand up. And it shocked me, because out of nowhere, I'm looking at this thing. And it's looking back at me, and in that moment, I realized, you know, holy shit, because, you know, while I heard sounds and noises and footsteps and stuff up to this point, I had never seen anything face-to-face, regardless, uh, you know, anything like that. So that, because growing I'd always had my, you know, I'd always, you know, had my suspicions of stuff like that existing growing up, but obviously, I'm open-minded, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, I've never really seen anything, so I can't say, you know, 100%, you know, anything like that exists, you know, and that, and that right there was like, you know, the proof, it's like, like, wow, um, and it felt like hours, I felt, I felt like I, I stared at that thing for hours and hours and hours, and it felt like it just pierced through my eyes down into my soul, and it was just staring me down. First of all, it looked like this thing was more like torso almost, kind of like, 
Um, now, obviously, like, I can't give you, like, like you know, how much of a ratio, but it, lo- it looked like, you know, with the grass and everything, it kind of looked like it was more torso, like, with stubbier um, legs. Um, the arms were kind of, um, they weren't, like, twigs, but, like, compared to, like, its torso, um, its arms looked kind of, like, skinny almost compared to the torso. Like, you know, it had, like, a little gut. You know, it's kind of, like, you know, hunched over. The, the skin was more, like... Um, like a darker color, like it kind of looked kind of like gray in the in the, in the lights. Um, had like a longer nose. Um, I can tell you for sure the eyes. Um, that's just what I remember most is the eyes. Like I kind of I kind of caught like you know freak glimpses and everything else, but um, those eyes were amber colored, and I was just so focused on those. So while it felt like hours, I bet it wasn't more than 10, 15 seconds, if even that. And then out of nowhere, I snapped out of it, and, and I was I was like, Jesus, you need to get the hell out of here. So you know, once I snap out of it, I put the truck in reverse, I whip out of it, and then I just speed off down the road. I, I get home as fast as I can. So that was like you know the like one of the first few times you know up to that point where you know, where I could say definitively like that's not right. You know, besides you know like certain footprints and stuff like that. So what it was later at night. Um, you know. Uh, I was getting ready for bed. I brought both my dogs in, you know, so it's like probably 2 or 3 a.m., you know. I literally just got, haven't even laid down yet. So I have like a motion sense, a motion light sensor um, um, out, outside my door, just, you know, it makes life easier. So, you know, it's like 2 or 3 a.m. at night, and the motion light goes off, you know. And, and I don't think, I try not to think too much of it, like, you know, no big deal. And then, but then what starts freaking me out is like your footsteps outside and obviously like there's a there's a distinction between when something has four feet and it's walking because that's almost like a trot but this thing sounded exactly like you know one two one two and it was stepping you know on two feet and then you know all of a sudden i hear the same thing behind my shed you know so i'm like okay so whatever it is there's two of them and then all of a sudden i hear i hear a third pair of footsteps like to the right of it so i'm, I'm starting to like actually like kind of freak out Cause I'm like, you know, that that's not, because that also sounds like too big to be like, you know, something small like a raccoon or a possum, you know. And then obviously it's not a coyote because, you know, it sounds like it's on two feet. And then the damnedest thing is, so my, my at this point my dogs are up and they're, and, you know, and my one of my dogs is ready to get out there, you know, tear something apart limb by limb. And then it sounds like something, kid you not, jumps onto the uh, onto the side of it, of, of my of my place. And it sounds like it climbs up almost. I don't know how to explain it, but it sounded kind of like, you know, it was slipping, but it kept its grip. You could hear it, like, get on top of the roof and then step one, two, one, two, one, two on top of the roof. And then there was one point where it stopped. And then, I don't know, it kind of sounded like it jumped almost. Like, you know, like it did like a little, like, kid jump. You know, like you jump up and down real quick. And then it did one, two, one, two. And then they kept doing that, and then the other two were still on the ground, and they're walking around the shed, and they're banging on the walls and stuff. So that's so you know that's freaking me out all night, and then back then that went on for an hour or two, just repeatedly, just all you know, banging on the walls, walking around, you know, all that stuff. I didn't hear a single like a single sound other than footsteps or banging though. Like I didn't hear like any any talking or vocalizations or anything. So the closest people to me are my mom or my mom's parents you know like my grandparents on that side and i haven't heard a peep out of them since like 11 o'clock midnight you know so I'm, and, and even then like that they were messing with me you know some obviously sometimes the family will mess with you you know if they would have you know barged in after 10 minutes and even then the next day i asked them i was like you know were you messing with me last night and my grandpa was like what the hell are you talking about and i was like you know, you, you you know, weren't you banging all over my wall and stuff and throwing stuff at the shed last night? He's like, no, what are you talking about? So um, I went up to college uh, uh, in August of, of 2020. I, I went up to college, so during that time, I, I didn't have you know too much going on because obviously I'm in a whole other city. I'm on a campus. You know, I don't really have to worry about anything like that anymore. Um, my, so on the other hand, my sister started having. Um, they started having experiences. Now, some of these involved, some of them are, are just them being sober and some of them are being non-sober, but regardless of them being sober or not, it's the same story. It's the same story. So, um, you know, at night, whether it was, you know, to go sneak off and smoke or it was just to go, you, you know, for a walk, whatever the reason was, they, you know, they would walk at, at night sometimes. 
And this happened, I want to say, two, three, or four. It was either two, three, or four times, one of those. And and it was the same thing every time. Nothing too aggressive, but it always freaked them out. They'd be walking down the property, and they would hear something kind of, you know, in the, in the tree line, you know, like, you know, like, these twigs, you know, snapped. You know, something sounds like it's walking, you know, and they'd get freaked out. And they would shine the light, and every single time they'd see something kind of like, you know, crouched over deep into the deep into the thicket, and it'd be, it'd be wanting, you know, it'd be kind of watching them. And it, it was just, and they couldn't really tell me any details. The only details they could tell me is it, it looked human shaped, and because they couldn't get the light deep enough, they couldn't see, you know, like, you know, any like um, skin details or anything, but they just saw like a black human shaped, um, you know, outline in the trees, and it would always freak them out. So one night, I, you know, I was at work, and my, my phone's blowing up and you know it's my it's my ex you know and obviously at the time we were dating um so she you know you gotta come on you gotta come on I'm like you know like hey like like maybe chill out like I'm at work you know I've, I've got like 45 minutes I'll be home in an hour you know like, like just let me finish I can't just leave work right now we're closing up you know she's freaking out you know you know the place is trash you know blah, blah. I'm like calm down calm down so I get home and the RV is trashed. I see all kinds of clothes and dishes outside on the ground. You know, so I'm like, well, who the hell did it? She told me that she got home and the RV was the exact same way it was. You know, like trash, trash, trash. She didn't get home until about 10 o'clock at night. You know, I didn't get home until about midnight. Um, but when she got home, it was obviously before me. And so she goes in there and, and when I went in there, well, two hours later, same thing. The most putrid smell was putrid smell. You would go and everything was a cupboard rope and drawers rope and couch cushions were flipped over. Or our clothes were, that was all torn apart. You know, freaking bathroom was a mess. And she said while she was walking, you know, towards the back end of the RV, towards the master bedroom, she said she saw some, she saw one of them hunched over in the corner because when you're walking to that master bedroom, it's a big enough, uh, like gap to the right that's something small like a puck kind of hunched down and you wouldn't be able to see it if you weren't looking for one and she just happened to notice it because it, it barely moved and so that freaked her out because you know in her mind she's like holy shit like this thing was going to ambush me as soon as i got back there so she so she played it off you know something stupid you know like oh there's the mayo you know or some you know something dumb like that and then she grabbed you know whatever she was faking to grab and then she ran she ran back into the shed she locked, you know, closed the door, and she was sitting there, and then she heard something run across the RV, down the steps, and then run off into the tree line. So I get home, I'm like, damn it. So I walk in, and I had, you know, like one of those little Xbox video games, and obviously when you get those, you have like the little pamphlet inside of you, you know, like controls and stuff like that. And this thing tore open the, the cover, and... Now, now, obviously, I could be wrong, but it, it looked like this thing, you know, you know took a piss on, 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 on the magazine. It smelled like it, too. It, it literally smelled like it because I, I couldn't help it. I was a little curious. I smelled it, and it's, it was atrocious. It's like it's pretty much like it's like it's like someone took a piss on, on a dead skunk. It is it's the best way to describe it. These things, these things hate dogs. They hate dogs. Um. I got, I got my ex. I got, uh, my friend gave me a German Shepherd for free once. And, um, and I, I told my, I told my ex, I was like, here, you know, like, this is, this is your dog down, you know, and she took it, obviously. So, the dog's name was Moose. Uh, so, they heard Moose freaking out, freaking out. So, they go outside, and, and Moose, is, and all of a sudden, Moose breaks off the leash, and she goes running into the woods after something. And what, and, and it's almost what they hear is, is they hear moose, you know, aggressively um, attack something, and then they hear a big scuffle, and then they hear moose yelp, and and then they, they hear a little more fighting, so they go after moose, and they find moose in this uh, in this little ditch, and, and she's fine. She's looking at them all happy, like you know, oh my god, I did it, and then they see, you know, pretty much. The best way to describe it is you can see like where something was almost like running from moose in the leaves and the moose tackled it and you see where the dirt and everything's all messed up and then you can see where they rolled down into the ditch and then i guess whatever it was you know hurt moose so then she yelled and then they scuffled some more in the ditch and then finally got away from moose and then they brought moose back so it sounded like moose 
attacked, you know, one of the pucks. They rolled down to the ditch. The puck bit it or punched it or something, or, or something to the dog. The dog let go. The dog tried to latch back on, but it was still able to get away. But I've never seen anything from everything that I've experienced and the people around me have experienced. It seems um, like like they're more physical. Um, like um, now whether you want to eat, what, now whether you want to argue that they're an animal or they're some you know a human relative is a whole whole other discussion, obviously. But I think they're um, more on the uh, animalistic uh, piece of wildlife nature uh, nature side. Native stories across the continent assert the Pukwudgie is just one variety of many small humanoids, often referred to as the little people. So the Nain Rouge, um, I have known about the Nain Rouge, I'm in my 40s now, so I have known about Nain Rouge for over, I want to say 25 years. Um, he is a huge part of Detroit's folklore and not just Detroit's folklore but its history because the Neen Rouge is actually a part of um, the founding fathers of Detroit when Cadillac um, he had not even come to Detroit and he was warned not to upset the Neen Rouge and this is when he was actually in the settlement in um, what is now Quebec but at that time it was New France and so as he's there and he's getting his entitlements and he's um, basically uh, working his way up the ladder for more um, titles, more authority, more uh, political stance, he is asked to come into the, the West, and um, which means he has to travel not only through Quebec and Ontario, but across the Detroit River, and they decide to set up on the other side of the Detroit River as a trade route. Now, having this assignment, this is you know this is a major assignment. But the the night that they're they're throwing the party for him, this fortune teller comes calling, and when he asks her, you know, will I will I be successful and will my ch children inherit my success? She tells him. Yes, as long as you don't provoke the Nain Rouge. And this is this is hundreds of miles away from Detroit, or what you know will now be you know present day Detroit. And so it it you know goes down in history that the Nain you know that Cadillac he he makes his, his journeys to the Detroit River, crosses the river, builds a settlement, and then no sooner is the settlement built and people are actually um, prospering um, or starting to prosper there at, at what is now uh, Fort Detroit or New um, Paris or New France. He and his wife are strolling along the river and he encounters the Nain Rouge. And his wife, remembering what the, the gypsy fortune teller had told them, tells him, no, 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 just leave it alone. Let the, let the little creature be. Cadillac says, no, I, I'm going to fight it because how dare it, you know, you know, come towards me and be bearing a stick and, you know, engaging me in the duel. So they do duel. Um, Name Rouge has a stick, a branch, and Cadillac has his cane. Cadillac, of course, wins and proceeds to beat the Name Rouge with his cane until the Name Rouge scampers off. And that kind of sets everything um into motion with Detroit always having um, we are one of the comeback cities in America but we are always getting uh, hit on the head so to speak and we kind of have to restart from there so Benin Rouge has uh, folklore wise he has played a major part in Detroit's history since it was founded by Cadillac Many historians, many folklorists believe that he was a guardian, a nature spirit, who was um, summoned here by the Native Americans. He has since, you know, he has he has remained. And for him, the 
the area of Detroit and um, the Detroit River. And then we have a large island um, called Belle Isle that's uh, kind of middle of the river in between the, the Detroit side and the Canadian side. The Native Americans, you know, they believe that he was this nature spirit who is a guardian. And so you have both sides of the coin. You have the Native American um, uh, belief that he is here to protect and keep the natural occurring areas safe. And then you have the, the non-Native, um, us white settlers, uh, whether we're French or uh, German or European descent, um, who think he is, he brings the um, danger the, the accidents with him. The most recent of the Nain Rouge activity would have been like the 1970s. He's been blamed for um, like the riots that happened um, in the 1960s. He's been blamed for blackouts that have happened in the city. Back in the founding days when, when buildings were starting to be built, a huge fire came through and burnt everything down. He is blamed for that. Um, you know, we have a we have, we're not, it had, it didn't happen last year or this year, but the third Sunday of every March, there's always a parade where we, uh, you know, we chase the Nain Rouge around a, a certain neighborhood in Detroit and uh, he gives this big speech and usually there's people from the mayor's office, um, Detroit uh, Police Department there, and they actually grab him and they throw him in a car and uh, the story goes they, they drive him out to Toledo, Ohio and kick him out of the car. We very much embrace the Nain Rouge um, legend and, you know, is he a real creature? Um, People have spotted him. People have seen him. Uh, you know, when the when the blackout happened, um, it was two line workers were up had actually gone up an electrical pole, and as they were maintaining the lines, one of them looked down and saw what they thought was a child climbing up the pole. And they're like, "Dude, no, you can't do that!" Until you know, it looks up at them and they see see that it has a red face and these glowing yellow eyes and these you know. Um, sharp, you know, uh, jagged teeth, and it cackles at them and then climbs back down and goes scurrying off. And then within a few days, we have one of the worst blackouts in Detroit's history happen. So um, it has been recorded. People have seen him. But in this day and age, um, a lot of people, you know, are, are they paying attention to, you know, what goes on around them? Do they, you know, even anticipate that they could encounter the Dane Rouge. Robin Moonshadow is a native Canadian researcher who is very familiar with her people's stories. And to go by uh, various, various names. Uh, I have them here in my area. You have them there. Uh, North America, worldwide. And uh, they were the second or third reported sightings that I would get. The first ones were Papagwajis. And when you have a report, or I get a report of these little people that we call protopigmies, because that's what they are, is they're diminutive little humans. The name was coined by Ivan T. Sand when he was also receiving similar reports. Papagwajis are the worst of the worst. Uh, they delight in scaring us. Uh, they're also cool. Uh, stories go back to First Nations. And Moshat the Giant, they became jealous of Moshat the Giant because he was very beloved by the First Nations people. And they started causing havoc. They started chasing people around, uh, chasing them into the forest and getting them lost. You know, most of the giants and, and Papua are only a couple of feet tall. Uh, he throws them all over the place. And this is how they say to they come. They come to be in, in my area and in your area and around the Great Lakes. If you're going to look for Papua well, first of all, I would advise that you don't, but don't go alone. They're not friendly, they hate our guts. They don't like us, and it's better not to bother them at all. If they call your name, don't answer. The concept of the little people is not only widespread throughout the Americas, 
but it can be found all over the world. Paraguay boasts the legend of the Pombero, a hostile little person with the ability to vanish. Ireland is home to the Leprechaun, a small humanoid that often dabbles in mischief. Half of the population of Iceland believes in small elves, so much so that construction is often diverted to avoid potential elf habitat. Canada and Britain too have stories of little people. I'm Hammerson Peters and I write books and create YouTube videos on Canadian folklore. One subset of Canadian folklore that I really enjoy researching is monster lore, which many people equate with cryptozoology. The monster on which I've written the most extensively is the Wild Man, which appears in First Nations folklore across Canada. In Northern Canada there's the Nakani, which is often described as a giant, man-eating, hairy monster with red eyes. There is the famous Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, of the Pacific Northwest, and the lower Fraser River Valley, which is supposed to live in the mountains. There is the Kushtaka, or the shape-shifting land otter man of Klingit legend, which lives on the Alaskan Panhandle. There is the Wendigo of the Great Lakes and the Northern Forests, which in a lot of traditions is really more of a cannibalistic evil spirit than a monster. And there is the Lugaru, or the werewolf, of the St. Lawrence River Valley and Old Acadia in Nova Scotia, which is not really a wild man, but has many wild man elements. Of course, there are many non-wild man monster legends in Canada as well. There are lots of sea serpent legends and lake monsters and river monsters. There's the Ogopogo in Lake Okanagan, there's Champ in Lake Champlain. And there's the Thunderbird, which is often described as a giant eagle with preternatural abilities. Uh, when it flaps its wings, it makes thunder, and when its eyes glint, it makes lightning. Believe it or not, there are mermaid stories, and vampire legends, and there are the little people. What are little people? There are as many answers to that question as there are little people traditions, and in Canada at least, I know of ten, and there's probably many more. That said, there are a number of characteristics which a lot of the variants share, which paint a disturbingly consistent picture of a race of little, elusive, man-like beings who live in the wilderness or on the fringes of the civilized world. As their name suggests, little people are usually, although not always, supposed to be smaller than the average human being. In most Canadian traditions that I've read about, they're between two to four feet in height. They are almost always mischievous people, with magical abilities, who delight in tricking humans who trespass on their territory, or who disrespect them. The most dramatic little people stories in Canada, in my opinion, are the fairy stories from Newfoundland. According to Newfoundlander tradition, which has its roots in Celtic folklore, the fairies are almost entirely malevolent, and they will often abduct people in the wilderness and take them to their own realm, which Newfoundlanders call Fairyland, or In the Fairies. Abductees who manage to escape the fairies and return to civilization are almost always changed in some way, usually for the worse. One of the spookiest Newfoundland fairy stories that I have read about revolves around a man named Davy Mercer, who lived on Bell Island in Conception Bay that's on the Avalon Peninsula in uh, Newfoundland's south uh, eastern corner. In the early 1920s, the story goes, when Davy was a boy, he was playing with some friends in the woods when uh, he got lost and disappeared. His parents found him several days later, curled up by a tree in a state of obvious terror. He was never able to explain what happened to him in the woods, although many people assumed that he was taken by the fairies. Upon his return to civilization, Davy was not the same. He walked with a limp and he spoke with a speech impediment. Those who saw him years later, when he was an old man, said that he wore a perpetual, ghoulish grin on his face which horrified the local children. I've found little people's stories in the folklore of both certain First Nations and Euro-Canadian settler societies. From what I've read, the Innu, or Montagnanescopi Indians of Labrador in eastern Quebec, traditionally believed in two varieties of little people one of which lived in the forest, and the other being associated with rivers and lakes and water. The French Jesuit missionaries who recorded these stories in the 1600s seemed to regard the water dwarf as 
a mermaid or a siren. Although the only Innu ethnology I've personally read makes no mention of the dwarf lore, the online sources I've consulted seem to suggest that the modern conception of the Innu water dwarf is that of a short, hairy man or woman who lives in the cliffs along rivers. The water dwarves were said to be mischievous and would play dangerous tricks on canoeists who paddled past their homes. The Anishinaabe peoples of the Great Lakes and the westerly and northwesterly Cree have their own little people legends which seem to be cut from the same cloth as their Innu counterpart. In northern Canada, the various Dene peoples believed that a race of little men lived in the Mackenzie Mountains and could conjure powerful winds and had a penchant for kidnapping women. The Inuit of the High Arctic also believed in mountain-dwelling elves who were fun-loving and could transform themselves into animals. The interior Salish tribes of central British Columbia believed in a race of little men who lived on the steep cliffs and in the dense forests of the Middle Fraser Basin. These dwarves were said to have the ability to shapeshift and to create optical illusions. Some of the Indians believed that they were the spirits of cedar trees. Interestingly, the Euro-Canadian pioneers who settled in Canada throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries had their own little people legends which have a lot in common with their indigenous cousins. As I mentioned earlier, Newfoundlanders have their own fairy tradition which seems to be a heritage from their Celtic and Anglo-Saxon ancestors. In the Madawaska Highlands in southern Ontario, not too far from Algonquin Provincial Park, uh, Polish Canadians or Kashubian Canadians are said to have traditionally believed in dwarves who inhabited their stables and their barns. The French Canadian habitants of the St. Lawrence River Valley have a similar tradition about little goblins they call lutins, who either confer luck upon them or play tricks on them depending on how they're treated and the Icelandic Canadians from a district called New Iceland on the western shores of Lake Winnipeg traditionally believed in huldefolk, or elves, who lived in the wilderness outside their settlements. I think there are three possible explanations for the universality of Little People legends. The first is that our legends of Little People is a heritage of our ancient ancestors' interactions with diminutive hominids, like the archaic pygmies whose bones are found on the island of Flores, Indonesia. Stories of those interactions were passed down throughout the generations, gradually morphing with every retelling until they transformed into the legends we know today. The second possibility is that little people are preternatural or other dimensional beings. Both First Nations and Euro-Canadian settler tradition contend that little people have magical abilities, not least of which is their ability to remain concealed from mortal eyes and in some traditions disappear at will. The third possibility is that little people are products of human imagination, generated for the purpose of explaining otherwise unexplainable phenomena. For example, a naturally occurring phenomenon called fairy rings, which is a circular pattern in grass which we now know is caused by subterranean fungi, was once believed to be the spot on which dwarves or elves or goblins had danced. What I personally find very interesting is that certain unexplained phenomena which were once attributed to the mischief of little people are now attributed to other equally mysterious agents. For example, both Newfoundlanders and the Polish-Canadian settlers of the Madawaska Highlands observed that their babies would sometimes undergo a dramatic and undesirable behavioral and physical change several months after birth. Traditional folklore explains this transformation by suggesting that the original baby was stolen by dwarves or fairies, and substituted for a changeling, an ugly, cantankerous substitute. Bizarrely, mysterious infantile transformations continue to occur to this very day. Instead of blaming the little people, as their ancestors might have done, many modern parents blame their infant's personality changes on the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine after the administration of which many of the changes seem to occur. In a stark example of historic recurrence, this anti-vaxxer philosophy is condemned by the medical community and the mainstream media with an energy bordering on fanatical. In the exact same way, Western academia once roundly condemned a belief in little people. Another sort of strange occurrence which would once have been blamed on the little people are the unsolved disappearances described by American author David Politis in his Missing 411 series. 
The best example of this that I've come across is the case of four-year-old Betty Wolfram, whose case plight is included in his 2019 book, Missing 411 Canada. Betty Wolfram vanished on May 15, 1934, near the tiny rural community of Moosehorn, Manitoba, which is just east of Lake Manitoba. Her father, Carl, placed the sleeping Betty in a carriage outside the, the family farmhouse before going out to do some seeding in the field. By the time he came back, Betty was gone. Carl and his neighbors searched for Betty for five days, during which the surrounding area was pummeled by torrential rain. On the fifth day, Betty was found wandering in a swamp in a semi-conscious state. The doctor who subsequently examined her was quoted as having said, quote, Examination of the child reveals little loss of flesh and no evidence of dehydration. Furthermore, in view of the fact there have been so many mosquitoes present, it is significant that there are no bites or scratches present. In my opinion, this child has had food, water, and some shelter for the past three to four days as I do not believe that a child who has always been delicate could have withstood this long exposure and show so little trace." Unquote. Other newspaper articles indicate that Betty was found completely dry, despite the heavy rain, and that her clothes were relatively clean, considering the duration of her backcountry ordeal. Other newspaper articles indicated that Betty seemed to be in a state of terror following her rescue, and that she spoke very little following her return to civilization and would spend her time sleeping or whimpering softly. Betty later told her mother that, on the day of her disappearance, she met a woman and a little girl whom she presumed was her daughter. On the day of her rescue, a man pointed her in what proved to be the direction of her family's farmhouse and told her to start walking. Investigators followed up on this lead but were unable to find any evidence of human habitation anywhere in the surrounding area. The last element of this piece was provided by a local farmer named George Romain, who told the RCMP or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who were investigating the case that during Betty's absence, his milk cow would return for three days in a row, uh, having already been milked dry. If Betty Wolfram's disappearance had taken place in 19th century Newfoundland, it would have been considered a classic case of fairy abduction. Many young girls who are said to have been abducted by fairies in Newfoundland are said to have been found completely dry despite heavy rain, just like Betty Wolfram. Many Newfoundlandic fairy abductees are said to have been taken and returned in swamps, like Betty Wolfram. Returnees from fairyland in Newfoundland folklore are said to return changed in some way for the worse, which seems to be the case with the whimpering, quiet, sleeping all the time Betty Wolfram. And in Newfoundland folklore, fairies are said to sometimes milk cows, like what happened to George Romaine's cow in the story of Betty Wolfram. Now, interestingly, the story of Betty Wolfram takes place about 50 kilometers or 30 miles west of a district called New Iceland, which is inhabited by Icelandic Canadians who traditionally believed that elves called Huldafolk lived in the wilderness outside their own settlements. The only physical evidence of little people that I've ever heard of is that little mummy that they found in a cave in Wyoming in the 1930s. I think some miners found it, and it's called the San Pedro Mummy. Uh, and I think if you just look at that thing, it's clearly an anencephalic human baby and not a, not a little person. Well, I mean, this is this is a sighting actually that I had I had read about through Nick Redfern. It had been referred to me by somebody else, and I, I I don't know if Nick was the first person to report it or if he had um, you know, if he had uh, publicised it first. Uh, this sighting to me seemed when I was when I was first looking for little people sightings in the UK, I, I'd written a chapter called the little people or the hairy fairy folk and what I was trying to do was find some correlation between um, our folklore of fairies and little people in the past especially things like brownies for instance and try to match that to a possible presence of a little foot if you like akin to the Janjari of Australia um, or even, even something like your pendic although that seems a, a lot more simian just trying to 
to say, could people have been seeing real animals? And in their archaic, ancient superstitious way of interpreting these animals as supernatural beings. Now with the trolls of slitting bills, what you have is a very strange situation. This is a young couple, they're returning from a Christmas party in 1975. Uh, two children are sleeping in the car. Now, they're driving towards their home. There's a slitting mill, which is in Staffordshire. Right? Staffordshire has got many strange and unusual areas. There's lots of high strangeness, if you will, around that, around that um, part of the UK. A uh, car stalls, and the husband jumps out and checks the engine. While he's returning to the car, his wife screams as she sees a small figure run quickly across the road in front of them. And what she describes is. Uh, one creature, then another, then another creature running across the road. And then she said they looked like hairy trolls, um, almost like little men with hunchbacks and, and big hook noses, no clothes on, just covered in hair all over. So they were all four foot tall ish. And um, she could see them all waiting in the edge of the trees, looking wary or something like that. Now, the full vision of the story actually claimed that the couple believed that they lost time. They felt as if they passed out and gone, they lost time, or they, they lost consciousness in some way. And it's never expanded upon. So there's the paranormal side of it. And I always wondered, you know, does this, does this perhaps pertain to some, some more of a paranormal or you know, UFO style sighting, perhaps even? But the details of the sighting are what are most important. It's short, it's about four foot tall, it's hairy, it's troll-like. And um, yeah, with that description, I actually part of those, those details to the artist, uh, Brett Manning. I did my piece of Brett Manning, and she drew drew that picture based upon that sighting. And I think yeah, that's a, it's a pretty good candidate for the traditional looking brownie, and also for for a little foot you know, character to, to have been real in this country. Now, 1975, it's not hundreds of years ago, but it's you know, this is essentially an anecdotal second-hand sighting. It is a long time ago. But I do have another sighting, which is very, very interesting. Again, of a small, uh, hairy-like creature that was seen in a place called uh, Evesham. Now, this is in the 1980s. Uh, a young man was making his way home, uh, walking along the dark streets, the street lights were out, and he noticed a, a large bulk uh, directly beneath a lamppost. And um, he, he wondered what it was, you know, there was this unusual thing standing there. And to his disbelief, he seemed to see an animal of some sort. Uh, it's got rugged hair. Um, notices that the body is raising up and down to the motion of his breathing. He says it appears to be standing on its hind legs and um, it's over one meter high, got his back towards him, and uh, he thinks it's a bipedal hominid of some sort. Now he said it seemed to be crying or sulking, exactly in the way that a small child might do uh, if it was um, being told off and was, it was hiding its face. And was its right arm was, it was upwards and against his forehead, and the body was tipped forwards on the lamppost. And um, he was freaked out, obviously, and walked away on the other side of the street as, as quickly as he could. And that, to me, again, that, that matches that kind of sighting. Again, it's about a meter tall, it's hairy, you know, it's, it, it's bulky, and it's, I think, extraordinary. As, as a modern day sighting of, of some of the creatures that could be here, but without neighboring the point too much, those were the types of things I was looking for in Britain. Is there some sort of corroborative type for a little foot or a, a modern day brownie existing in our country? Despite these beliefs being seen as folklore, it is true that the little people were once very real. The little people, 
they're, they're, they're flesh, flesh and blood. blood. Uh, but, but they, 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 they like haunted, haunted locations. locations. It could be uh, going, going back, back 20, 20 years ago. People didn't want to go to these haunted, haunted, haunted locations. locations. They, they were afraid they're, they're not going to go there. It's a good location for little people to be because people don't go there. Uh, I, think I think that, that they, they should, should be placed, placed in Homo, just, just like, like Homo Luzon and Homo Floresis, of course. So, so there, there's proof of protopigments right there. there. Um, they, they were hunting hours. Robin's points about prehistoric, or, or rather archaic, human ancestors that were diminutive in size, so we're talking between the whole range between, you know, two to five feet tall, three to five feet tall, is is really interesting because our, our first example of that was, was Homo floresiensis on the island of Flores in Indonesia. They were a species of human that only grew to about between three and four feet tall. And, uh, you know, that was really interesting as a find because they called it the Hobbit because it was a fantasy concept until then, essentially. And, you know, then you have the discovery of Homo Luzon, which is a very similar species in the same general island region. And, uh, as Robin notes, uh, they had finger bones that were very adept for climbing. So there's a connection between the arboreal idea of little people in the native mythology and Homo Luzon. And, of course, you have other examples, you know, Red Deer Cave people, uh, Minatagawa Man in, in what is now Japan. You know, just these really interesting cases of diminutive human ancestors, especially in Eastern Asia. And, uh, you know, when thinking about things like the Bering Land Bridge that formed, uh, you know, the melting of the ice corridor that allowed these, uh, these modern humans to migrate from what is now Siberia into Alaska and populate North America, it almost is very conceivable that a small population of diminutive humans may also have come across and now persist in those regions. Uh, and that may, may account for, you know, what people are reporting to see. And also in those same areas, you have stories like the Ibugogo. Well, also, also in that, that area, you have, uh, like, like Lo called Lo Luzon. And there, there are two stories. Two stories. Two stories. Uh, uh, the ones, ones that are called Duende. So, so it's... it's a singular, a singular name that, that means all of the little people. people. I know and that, that one of the one day uh, likes to cause mishap. They, they, they just run around and, and just make life miserable. miserable. And, and then, then in another, another part of the island, they see the one day as good little people. people. Uh, they, they live in trees. They live in trees high, high up in the canopies. And they will help you if they can. Now, what is very interesting about those particular one days is that a bone in the wrist of Homo Luzon says they can climb trees. Sightings, though, are not the only evidence for Pukwudgies and other little people. Uh, we have track evidence. Uh, the first protopigmy track that I've ever seen was in upstate New York. And I was looking, and I just happened to walk down, and it was in the mud on the beaver dam. And he walked, or she, well, we'll say he, walked over the beaver dam. So uh, I was only able to get pictures of one track. They don't try to hide their, their footprints either. Uh, this is the first track that I cast. Uh, and 2019. This is a native little person, and they wear moccasins. Mm. No, I know that this is the moccasin because it leaves the same print, kind of print as my moccasins do. And we have the toes. And I said, then this was found in April, in one of my research areas. And this one I, I got in a bit of a muddy field, uh, and they went around the puddle. Instead of going through the puddle, it would be deep for them. Uh, these ones are two, two and a half feet tall. Uh, now, what, the next one that I have is I may make a Westing. And you'll notice his footprint, it is a barefoot, is a bit different. He has the angled toes, much like ours. 
And again, this is four inches. And this does coincide with, with the picture that I have. Something else that I have here, and I have seen better, I just haven't been able to cast them, is a handprint. Now remember, this is smooshed in the mud, and I think what had happened is maybe he slipped and put his hands down. And it's, it's a bit larger than what you can imagine because it, there's slippage in it. Cast evidence is important. They, they give us an, an estimated size, weight, and of course, footwear. Footwear as well, like I said, the, the, the main make a scene. The hairy little person uh, doesn't wear shoes, where you see moccasins. And it's not just in my area that I've seen these, I've also seen these in, in the United States as well. Uh, well, we have photographic evidence. Um, I have a, a hairy little person, uh, a main ego westing, and, it, and it's clear that there's some form of hominid hairy little person in the, uh, in, in the picture that I have. The photographs expand beyond what Robin has too. There is a researcher in Massachusetts, Andrew Lake, who's investigated a property where there are consistent reports of, you know, paranormal activity and Pukwudgie sightings. And there's a photo he believes to contain a the, the face of one of the Pukwudgies that supposedly haunts the property. You've also got a report that sounds a lot like one of Ralph Hutchinson's reports from that property, where a, uh, a family friend reported seeing what they described as a quote-unquote little werewolf in the yard. So that's pretty interesting, too. Another photograph is even more compelling. so much that happened at this house and for the most part that I owned it I think I only stayed there four months out of five years and the rest of the time I rented someplace um, it was uh, awful you just walk in and you could just feel that that vibration in the air it was crazy I had been told by a medium that I would be chased out of the house by um, an evil spirit and I would get the smell of uh, uh, freesia. Freesia was my mother's favorite flower. So one day I'm standing in the front room uh, of the downstairs of the house and I get this overwhelming smell of freesia and I hear my mother say, get out. And I'm like, oh my god. Right out the door I went and I never went back for a few days. Um, people reported numerous things. I did a uh, a benefit for animal welfare because so many animals lost their life there and um, a lot of people went in with video equipment and so forth and the stuff that we got was just amazing. Uh, one man got a picture of a half a man from just like the chest up and he's waving in the picture. Uh, we believe he's a caretaker of the property and apparently he was um, mentally challenged. And he stayed, he's still there. And I actually did see him in the backyard one day. I had a group of people walking through the, the wooded area in the backyard. And I see this man step out of the woods, but all I can see is a man from the chest up. Same man. And he's waving at me. And I'm like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> I mean, stuff was just crazy. We got some pictures of the barn upstairs window, which is no upstairs to the barn, it's just one level there are these creepiest things that you could ever imagine. I mean, they just defy your imagination. Um, and my, my Scotty here, he was with me one day and we pulled in and he said, he looked at me and he had this, his face just went gray and he said, I said, you saw him, didn't you? He says, yeah. And I said, describe him. He said, oh my God. I went, yeah, you saw him. One girl went into the downstairs bedroom and she got super sick. And we had taken pictures on the exterior of that same downstairs bedroom. And you can see what looks like a face of um, that, that actor from the 20s and 30s who play, always played Dracula. Oh, I can't think of his name, he just left me, but um, 
Yeah, he was, uh, he was, it was, it was a picture of him. A friend of mine got a, a picture of, um, she just randomly took pictures inside the house with a 35 millimeter and she got this picture of what looks like a troll. And we discovered that it was a puck wedgie. So she was there doing a, 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 you know, she brought her team in and they were doing that thing because it was a favorite hot spot. And um, she just randomly took pictures all around the house and she got some good stuff. She got a picture of um, the top of the stairs of a man who looks exactly like a picture I found in the shed of a guy that owned it from Connecticut. And a witch. I mean a real honest to goodness witch. And they both have ropes around their necks. So that was the one thing she got. And the other thing was this figure that we finally decided was a puppwedgie. And uh, it's holding um, infants in its arms that are obviously dead. So I got really nervous. I looked back in the records. I went all the way back to the late 1600s to get records on the house. And I don't see any recorded deaths there. Um, I, um, I went to one, the local cemetery, so if you go at the end of that road and turn right, there's a big cemetery up on the left. And there's a woman there from the early 1900s, and because of the flu epidemic, she lost all but one of her children. And all of them were, three of them were infants when they passed. So I'm thinking this has something to do with that. The team's final investigation into the Pukwudgie phenomenon brings them to the site of the Howe sighting to investigate the potential presence of little people. Was or is maybe the end of the last name? Mister. Yep. Hmm. Might be a Mrs. right here as well because it's a big M. Lots of crickets is what I'm hearing. Yeah, lots of them. Which is actually discouraging because a lot of like uh, the category is often called little people, but you know, like Native American little people stories. Mm. A lot of reports from those actually include uh, an unusual stillness in the forest. I've noticed that. Um, I got one just last week from Washington, actually, and the first thing that they said was you couldn't even hear bugs. There was nothing. I mean, I mean, it makes sense when something predatory goes through. Bugs and things go quiet. Yeah, right. Like the birds do too. Everything mm -hmm. kind of shuts off. We have goshawks on the land where I grew up, and the second that a goshawk would scream, every bird, every mammal would just stay quiet. They'd right. shut right up. Interesting. Because the first thing that moved died. Right. Because the goshawks will find it and they will kill it. Right, right. So it's anytime a predator is in the area, they just everything quiets down. So yeah. To be honest, investigating the place, it it felt so normal. So normal. Nothing, everywhere else we'd gone, something felt off, something felt weird. Everything felt so normal. It's, it's actually quite a suburban area, too. So we had neighbors, you know, very close to, to where this house actually is. And we had nothing happen while we were there. So, you know, we end up just leaving, going to get lunch before we head home. And while we're parked, we find these weird fingerprints on one of the car windows. They're left in this white, really hard to wipe substance that our fingerprints, when we tried to recreate these, they, they couldn't replicate it. Even, even leaving them there for a particular amount of time, 
wouldn't replicate it. So we're hoping to get swabs of these fingerprints, and there's a lot of them. Something, it, it looks like something, while we were away from the car, because no one had touched this window, it's a window that's behind the, uh, the right side passenger window in the back. So it's not attached to a door, it's not attached to a trunk, nothing. And it just looked like something came up, touched the window, smeared it with its hand, took its hand off, pressed it on again, something like that. And we didn't really know what to make of that. That was, uh, that was weird. That was very strange. What are we to make of such strange tales? We as humans are accustomed to legends of all kinds. While we often focus on current events, we are also storytellers by nature. Our cultures are filled with vibrant mythologies and colorful folklore. It is part of what makes us human. When I was nine years old, uh, I was visiting my aunt's house. And uh, as I'm going to the bathroom, I see some movement in the, in the far off room. I think maybe it's the cat. And no, this little guy comes up from behind the pile of holes. And he had a green tint to his skin. I, I didn't feel threatened. I'm just wondering what I'm seeing. He's not nine years old. He just, he just stood there and looked at me. And I looked at him and said, I'm nine years old. I know what I'm seeing. It's a little person. It was odd and weird, but not so frightening. Every story, though, does have a kernel of truth hidden within it. Perhaps the story of the Pukwudgie's truth is something metaphorical. A sort of cautionary tale. I think what's fascinating about little people across the world, you know, across cultures, is, you know, the archetype of the trickster. The trickster element is interesting because it's, it's mischievous and it's harmful or it's kind of beneficial but still a bit of a, of a mischievous creature. And, uh, you know, every culture, almost every culture anyway, in the world has stories of little people that fit exactly that archetype. Why that is, I'm, I'm not really sure yet, but the evidence, or at least the potential evidence that we've discovered in this documentary as we filmed it, is just so interesting to me because, you know, you have the hair sample, you have the fingerprints, you have the EVP from, uh, from Valen Cemetery, and it's hard to know what to make of, of all these cases, but as you as you progress further and further into the case and you find out, you know, the, you know, the tracks that Robin has, the, the track that, that we cast that hair in it, the, the fingerprints that left a, a material that does not come from human fingerprints. It's hard to know what to make, but you can't help but feel like there's, there's something to make. And what that means, I'm not sure. Just maybe, as the Wampanoag and so many others believe, there really is a small, human-like being hiding deep in the forests of North America, waiting to be discovered.